through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 230. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Uh, this is not just the time you get out of school. This is actually an episode of yes. the MacGuffin. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, today in the honor of the beautiful creatures, we're mm -hmm. going to be talking about sort of young adult movies. Which Spencer and I are not. No, we're, sorry, old, we're, we're, we're old men. Yeah, old we're not men. young adults. We're in the OM if, category. If we're, lucky, if we're very lucky, we've been classified as adults, but we would definitely not be put in the young adult category. I mean, in terms of, you know, young adult, we're going to be kind of liberal with our mm -hmm. interpretation of this. I think the sort of term YA sort yes. of came about from books. Yeah. Was that sort of the yeah. really driving yeah, force? Yeah, I think because it, it was more less what the topic was about and more who it was marketed to. Mm -hmm. So the young adult books were kind of more things gauged to like teens and post teens. And that's sort of In what tweens too. So. And that's sort of what you'll see as we talk about this. Obviously this is not like an expert analysis on young yeah. adult films. We're just talking about some that we think are interesting mm -hmm. or have made impacts on us. And sort of we're gonna try, try and talk about a little bit of what we've seen as sort of an evolution of yes. it. Yes. Perhaps Perhaps. We're Perhaps. not going to say it's fact. We're going to say what we <laughs> perceive. Just... This, this is all about perception, really. Yes. Yeah. You're watching, and so you're perceiving what we're telling you. Yes. Um, so we're going to start a ways back yes. in 1964 and talk about A Hard Day's Night. Yes. This is the film directed by, was it Richard Lester, mm -hmm. uh, starring The Beatles. Yes. About... The Beatles, mm -hmm. which, which is interesting because The Beatles is never mentioned as a line of dialogue in the entire film. Yes. In fact, it's only ever seen on Ringo's drum and the, and the intro card. Wow. That's a, that's mm -hmm. a very I spy kind mm -hmm. of shit right there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, when you think about The Beatles, in terms of when they were in this movie, mm -hmm. they were early 20s, you know, 22, yeah. 24, so they're not necessarily, I don't know, you, you might classify that still as young adult. Yeah. But their crowd, their audience was very much, you know, teens and yes. young adults. Yes, yes. So this is very much discussing that sort of aspect of it being who it was geared towards. Yeah, definitely like marketing towards not just kids, but kind of the starting to be the in-betweeners a little bit. Yeah. And the interesting thing when you think about this movie is, I mean, I don't know if this is sort of like a meta commentary about mm. the life of the Beatles. I mean, it was very much I mean, about a band yes. who's being swarmed by fans mm -hmm. and they, you know, they have to run away from it and they get into wacky adventures. Most of the fans when chasing them in the beginning of the film, actual fans. Yeah. So. But like, you know, they get into like adventures mm -hmm. along the way, like they have little side stories mm -hmm. that they get into, you know, at one point like Ringo goes off on his own, yes. stuff like that. They have their own little like sort of side stories mm -hmm. that they bring into the Paul's movie. Paul's grandfather. Yeah. His very clean yeah. grandfather. But, you know, you know, at the same time, like, it's very much about that sort of mania of Beatles. Yes. Which, I mean, I guess you could say, like, you know, Elvis, or any number of, like, pop stars. Yeah. Justin Bieber today, Oof. you know, it's sort of like yeah. that experience of, like, that celebrity. And I think part of the looseness of the film is due to the fact that U United Artists didn't really care much about the actual content of this film. They Just wanted Beatles? No, well, they were mainly interested in exploiting a legal loophole that would allow them to distribute the lucrative soundtrack album. Huh. So they wanted the Beatles to make a film where they would play a bunch of the Beatles music so that they, as a American distribution company, would have control over distribution of Beatles music, which was normally controlled, obviously, by British uh, studios and, and, contro and control. In fact, they fully expected to lose money on the film when they made it. Uh, with the final cost being about $500,000, which is still pretty big for the time it came out, but not that huge in general, and a box office take of about $8 million in the first week, A Hard Day's Night is considered one of the most profitable percentage-wise films of all time. That's pretty crazy to yeah. think about. Yeah, because they just really were like, you know what? We don't. We just want to make it so that they can get music in it, and so yeah, it was very a very strange loophole. There's a lot of weird stuff with the early Beatles albums being differently mixed and differently cut in America, so that American markets could gain some of that money. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's funny to think about for sure. I mean, you know, it's it's obviously that it was an avenue of making money off yes. the deals. Like, that's very clearly what yeah. this movie is about. And it's, it's funny to think about, though, that it was nominated for a couple Academy Awards. Really? It was nominated for Best Score. <laughs> um, Makes sense. Which uh, George Martin mm -hmm. was nominated for, but it lost to My Fair Lady. Mm. And it was nominated for, let's see, I think it was 
screenplay. Hmm. Um, Interesting. But you know, it's it's just kind of amazing to think about like a film like that. Yeah. Being nominated for an Academy Award, um, es- especially for the score, considering the like you know the whole point was to make get the soundtrack element that was not based on the score, but the actual soundtrack when it came out, I think, had like nine Beatles yeah. songs. It's best original screenplay. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> when you think about this film, you're not really thinking screenplay. It's true. It's true. You're like, wow, this is pretty simple. Let's make a funny story about an actual band. <laughs> and you got to love this, too. Um, it was nominated for the BAFTA Award <laughs> for most prominent, promising newcomers to lead film roles. So in other words, they thought the Beatles were going to be film stars? Is that what that seems to be saying? Possibility, but it's also just funny that uh, that it was even like, these guys might be something. Yeah, you know, it's true. Should, like yeah. if, they were, if they actually tried to be film stars, I'm sure people would throw mm-hmm. acting roles. I might think about Elvis. I mean, yeah. Elvis made tons of films because yeah. of that very reason. This has got to be very unique, though, because it's also nominated for a Grammy hmm. for original score written for a movie. Wow. So, yeah. both nominated for Academy Award and a Grammy. And it's one of the few that, that American soundtrack that they were trying to exploit is one of the few soundtracks. You don't usually get this in a soundtrack where it was actually a combination of soundtrack and score. Mm. Usually you get one or the other. You kind of get a score of the film or the soundtrack of the film, but there's not a lot of times where the two, I think, I feel mix very much. I think that's becoming le- uh, more common now when you think yes. about, like, you know, Katy Perry's movie, Justin Bieber, there's a One Direction one coming out. It's, it's much more sort of like the music and the score becoming one because yes. it is like a soundtrack to the film yeah. so like you know it's it's definitely becoming a much mm-hmm. more common thing but moving right along yes. we're gonna jump a couple decades forward to the mid 80s and talk about the breakfast club yeah talking about the john hughes classic here. no dad what about you yeah what about you greg <laughs> what about you um this is a story of was it five teens mm-hmm. who spend the day in detention yes. for various indiscretions yep and they're all come from different uh various backgrounds backgrounds and you know like cle- the, the, was cle- it clicks as well. yeah the jock the nerd mm-hmm. the space cadet the popular girl and like the punk or yeah whatever. The, like troublemaker or yeah. whatever yeah. yeah so all their reasons by the way for being in detention ad-libbed by the actors really yeah that's pretty cool they just kind of let them sit around and ad-lib i mean it, it's it's funny to think about like this is such a classic movie it's mm-hmm. hard to pick like a best john hughes film i i mean i, I would agree I might lean towards this one be my favorite, but mm. like I mean, you could easily throw Home Alone or any of those other ones at me. Yeah, but he didn't direct that technically. Um, but you know, of the ones he directed, yeah, the it, Pretty in Pink, Sixteen Candles, uh, yeah. I think Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. <laughs> yeah, um, that's right. I was yeah, that did, one. like so many good ones that like I think this is my favorite though. It's just it's such a relatable story. I yes. think is that I think everyone is regardless of their position in high school has that um connection yeah. to being you know, an outsider in yeah, some at some way. point yeah. And, yeah and like having trying to connect to someone across the aisle in that sense of being a different persona and it not working and i mean it's also noteworthy that you know you said two of the five were actually teens yeah when this was i think made. it was anthony michael hall was 17 and i want to say it was either ali sheedy or molly ringwald was the other i don't remember which mm. the rest of them i think were in their 20s but yeah ali sheedy was in her down. 20s it was uh molly ringwald looks like she was in her 20s as well oh. um maybe anyway. it was emilio yeah, yeah. <laughs> emilio <laughs> hey. maybe it's just me. yeah maybe it was just uh anthony michael hall i think i think it might have just been anthony okay. michael yeah um, actually, no. He, eh, they all look like they're in their twenties. I don't okay. know. I don't know what. I don't know. Either what, way, they're all very close. They were all very young. Yeah. It's it's still again, you know, a, a, a set as teens, mm-hmm. geared towards teens. Yes. Um, it's. Written, John Hughes wrote the screenplay in two days. Yeah. Well, that seems like cocaine must have been involved in some capacity. <laughs> I don't know how you could stay awake long enough to write like a screenplay. I mean, I guess if they're ad libbing a certain amount of well, it. Well, it's July fourth and fifth, nineteen eighty two, so there probably was cocaine involved. Yeah. 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 Um, it's just it's just such a fun film. I mean, I think you'd be hard pressed to find people who dislike it. Yes. I mean, it's because it is so relatable to so many people, even adults. There's even adult presence in the film all the time. Yeah. Yes. Was it Richard Gleason's in it? Yes. Uh, Paul Gleason. Paul yes, Gleason's the right. pr- principal. Richard uh, Vernon. Yeah. Who, interestingly enough, nice little callback here, is named after a minor character in Hard Day's Night. Wow. That's fucking... Like, yep. That's some shit that we didn't plan right yep. there. When the principal asks the janitor what he wants to gr- be when he grows up, he says that he wants... Janitor says he wants to be John Lennon. Wow. It's like a double callback to Hard yeah. Day's Night. Yeah. Boo! 
boom, yeah. and just dropping knowledge bombs yeah, exactly. all over the place. I, w- <laughs> I wish we could say we had this plan so much to the detail that we're going to do that, but mm-hmm. uh, sadly, that is not the case. I also find it really interesting because you think about it being such a like landmark or seminal film that just stands by itself as this great thing. Uh, it was originally planned to, that there would be several sequels to it. Did you know that? Spencer? I did not know that. Uh, they were going to make one every ten years in which the Breakfast Club would get back together. Wow, that's crazy. Unfortunately, it did not come to pass due to the volatile relationship between John Hughes and Judd Nelson. Mm. John Hughes has stated that he would never work with Judd Nelson ever again after this film. I mean, I guess that like he played that character so well, maybe he was somewhat like that. I don't know. Yeah, he was actually very mean to Molly Ringwald on the set, and Molly Ringwald's uh, agent complained to John Hughes, and John Hughes talked to... Uh, Judd Nelson's agent, he was like, no, he's just being the character all the time. Like, he's really he's a method the character. Yeah. yeah, he's pretty method. I guess, bravo. Judd yeah, Nelson. man, if you're gonna play the troublemaker, make it so much the filmmaker hates you. Boom! Here's, well done. <laughs> here's the craziest thing to me. It was nominated for nothing. No wow. awards, no nominations, no nothing. Wow. This is a film that is played all the time on, like, TBS mm-hmm. and TNT and stuff. Like, how... It got nominated like in the for fictional nothing. town of Shermer, Illinois. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but just like how how can you be so good and have no recognition of any sort, good or bad? They should have done the 2002s and gone back and looked at it. They probably did the 2020s. <laughs> yeah, 20. I guess it would be was it 85? Yeah, so 2080. Be, the 2005s it would be 2005. The, I can speak 2005. Right. <laughs> I speak good English. <laughs> All right, let's jump forward another yes. decade and talk about one that sort of is. Um, applicable to beautiful creatures, and okay. that is the craft. Yes, which is about witches. Yep, Wiccan witches. Which they wouldn't want you to call them in beautiful creatures. They're casters there, yes. but in this one, they're witches. Yes, um, we're talking the uh, the classic about four girls who join forces mm-hmm. and become witches through the powers, and then start back fighting, in fighting essentially because yeah. one of them wants to leave. Yeah, well, the, well, the power sort of gets to the other three, and mm-hmm. they sort of resent the one who doesn't want to use it for bad, yes. essentially. And, and this is definitely, a, I think, a, starts a theme, a theme that YA is grown out of, because in bookstores would be stuff like supernatural teens or teen supernatural very much romance. going forward, like, yeah, very much going forward that that became an issue. And you, you think about like the cast of this was like all. Not heavily known at the time. I mean, yeah. maybe Nev Campbell was known. I think Scream had come out before this, so Ski Ulrich was known. Mm-hmm. But like, and Fruza Balk was mildly known. Yeah. But like, Robin Tooney, I didn't know before this. Um, Rachel True's gone on to do mm-hmm. stuff. Like, it's it's a decent cast. I think I knew Robin Tooney just because Empire Records, which she was also mm-hmm. in. Which, mm-hmm. which great movie. Which I don't interestingly think I saw enough, that until after this. Well, yeah, I, I don't know which I saw first because I know I didn't. I would it would been I didn't see either of these films in the theater. I do find it interesting. One of the reasons I brought up Empire Records is that Robin Tooney wore a wig throughout the whole entire filming of The Craft because she had shaved her head for the role in Empire Records, which had only wrapped up filming a month before production The Craft started. Wow. So, so I was wonder. I think in the back of my head, I always wondered what was up with her hair, and it's good to know that it was a wig the whole time. That's why it was so strange. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a fun movie and if you take it lightly it's not yes. it's not like it's not meant to be like this heavy profound thing i mm-hmm. think it really speaks to the dynamics of um pure pressure oh, yeah. acceptance being an outsider again and, and i think that's some of the thing that becomes a, a, such a, a trope or even, even cliche almost in young adult is the idea that like there's so many changes going on there's new things happening with going through puberty and being mm. that age your life is in turmoil and changing so to add in supernatural elements where you have power in some sense that could make you either stronger than your peers or stronger than adults. I think there's something very, like, in people really can connect to that on some level, yeah. of being like, when I was a troublesome teen and nobody liked me, if I could cast spells, everybody would listen to me. Like, there's there's an allure to that. Yeah. And the director, Andrew Fleming, uh, has sort of a history with working in the YA spectrum. Mm. He did stuff like Nancy Drew. Okay. And he did Hamlet 2. Okay. If you remember that, which was about, you know, again, a high school. Yeah. So he's definitely got experience with that. Also want to note that, not again, not a lot of awards respect for this movie. Um, but it was nominated for Best Fight between Feruza Balk and Robin Tooney <laughs> at the end there, which is pretty awesome. So. I remember this being one of those films that I was verboten to see as a child because it involved witchcraft. And I, I-, I will say, though... 
one of the most memorable pre-movie trivia cards I mm. ever saw was talking about like the number of snakes and creatures yes. and stuff that they use at the end, uh -huh. which was like, what movie used 3,000 mm -hmm. snakes, 2,000, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I and like a Burmese python. Yeah. Yep. I like, almost I, put that fact in here, but I... I, re I remember that, that uh, <laughs> trivia card. <laughs> guy. Like, none other. Like, that's the one that stood <laughs> out for whatever reason. That was the most memorable one. I also, I think this is why maybe it was hard for some people to take it as lightly as, as possible. Maybe some people got a little bit not so okay with it. I mean, you're also right in the vein of um, of political correctness starting to make a huge statement in the country, but uh, Fruza Balk is actually a Wiccan and was really hardcore Wiccan and I believe that. helped the makers of the film keep the storyline as realistic as they could and to give point them out to Wiccan contacts in areas that she hmm. didn't have knowledge of and I think the magic shop in the in the film she actually physically bought wow. and ran until like 2005 or something. Wow. She's very. She's I would almost really think, into that. I would almost think that like she'd not want to do it because of that. That it's sort of like in That's some what ways. I would think too. I guess. I mean. I guess it doesn't make. It's not like a comedy about witchcraft. It's yeah. About like, and I would also. Yeah. It's, it's talking about the power of it. I guess. And how you should respect the power. Yeah. So I guess if you actually believe in it, then that would be that would make sense. So. Yeah. Jumping ahead a few years, uh, we're going to talk about one with local connections, and that's 10 Things I Hate About You. Boom! When I say local connections, it was filmed in the Seattle area, yes, largely. Yes, it was. Seattle and Tacoma. school used in the film was Stadium High School in Tacoma, Washington. Very, very memorable locale mm -hmm. with the stadium overlooking like the water and whatnot. Yeah, it was actually, the school itself was actually first built as a Grand Chateau-style railroad station hotel, but after it suffered extensive fire damage, it was renovated into high school. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, of course based upon the taming of the shrew yes. the shakespeare classic mm -hmm. with a um, lot of shakespeare references in the film as well yeah with uh julia styles and heath ledger a young yeah. heath ledger yeah. um because this, this is what, what, what year 99? 99 okay yeah so this is b before knight's tale but after roar no i think this I, I forget if this was his debut but it was very very early on for him at the very <laughs> least i mean it's 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 amazing to think about in some ways simply because it had Batman and the Joker, or oh, yeah. Robin and yeah, the Joker. That's a good before, point. Yeah, <laughs> if you actually think about it. But um, really think about that. That's, yeah, that's a good, I'm pretty good sure this is his American debut at the. At yeah, because Roar had been on television. Yeah, but pause stuff yeah. like this. So this is the one. Oh, yeah, that, this is pre the Patriot and the Night's Tale. Yeah, Man, no, he de this is definitely what him brought yeah. him to it. I think this is the. I remember this being the first thing I saw him in. Yeah. No, for sure. Me too. I mean, it, I think the thing that I like about the film is. That, you know, I mean, I guess yeah. I'm not an expert on Shakespeare, but, like, it, I think it made a much more sort of funny approach to the Taming of the yes. Shrew. Yes, it was more than just a, a shrewish uh, high school girl rather than, And like she wasn't, I mean, to be fair, calling her shrew is kind of unfair. Yes, I mean, she's true. just, she's very serious because of some experiences in her life yes. from learning, like, actually interacting with shitty high school dudes. So yes. she becomes sort of closed off. Yes. And this is trying to get her to... You know, open mm -hmm. up again. I think it's. I think one of the things that always interests me about this movie is that it has two kind of parallel love stories involved. That oh, are yeah. both very totally. different, and yeah. I think I think that yeah. For that's easy to get sorry. pulled into that. Julia Stiles mm -hmm. and Heath Ledger, and then Joseph Gordon-Levitt and, and Larissa, Larissa Olenek. Yeah. yeah, from uh, ten, uh, Secret Li Files of Alex Mack from yes. Nickelodeon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Love that show. Which I mean, I think is definitely very interesting because you're right; they're very different. The the Julia Stiles one is about getting her to open up mm -hmm. again, open up her heart again, and the. Was it Larissa Olenek? Mm -hmm. um, it's about her sort of detaching from the desire to be popular. Yes. And it, it's crazy to think about all the people that are in this movie. I know. I mean, David Crumholz, <laughs> uh -huh. Gabrielle Union, Susie, Susan May Pratt. I mean, it's just Larry Miller. It's crazy. Well, okay, I normally don't do the, like, who else tried to get that role thing, because I think they can be kind of boring. Oh, but consider, But considering... That Heath Ledger was, this was kind of a nobody at the time. And considering the t the other two actors I'm going to name, check out who he beat for this role. He beat Josh Hartnett and Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, that's pretty Can you amazing. imagine if either of them had been this movie? Not as much in, like, whether the movie would be good or not, because, but more like where their careers would have gone if they would have been, like, mm. because I don't know if ne necessarily think Hartnett and Ashton Kutcher were 
pretty much or really much of anything in 99. I'm trying to remember when that 70s show came out. Uh, I think it had to be going on there. Hartnet was definitely very, very early yeah, on, too. I mean, I think... Still I think that, crazy. I think they made by far the best oh, choice. I mean, I granted, the hair and stuff was kind of crazy at the time for Heath Ledger. Um, but in terms of, like, you think of, like, things like Charm... Yeah. and uh, charisma. Like mm -hmm. I feel like Keith Ledger is oh, by no. far the most of those guys. Oh, I, I agree that it was a better choice. I just think it's nuts to realize this guy yeah. who was essentially a nobody beat the guy who was like, beat the guy from uh, that 70s show and the guy from like first 40 dates or whatever. Yeah. 40, 40 days, 40 nights, whatever that movie yeah. was. Yeah. And those teen heartthrob movies yeah. that Josh Hartnett was in, a yeah. lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, def it's definitely impressive, but I mean, I think it really just, again, speaks to who Keith Ledger was mm -hmm. and how just talented and and see when I I didn't live in the state when I first saw this movie so me it was neither. actually weird re-seeing it once I had moved yeah, here and they're talking about the Huskies I was like wait how many teams have a hus wait a minute wait a minute it's actually a fair amount but yeah, yeah. nevertheless it was referencing those same Huskies At the time, I didn't it's like um when I watched was it the sixth man I think it was it like was it the Wayans brothers or okay. something like that? I forget what it was. I think it was like Marlon Wayans okay. and Kadeem Hardison or something like that. And it was filmed at UW. And I was like, that looks like Drum and Mueller Fountain. And I was like, oh my god, that is there the Husky. And I was like, oh my god, this is crazy. Oh. Um, but you know, it's it's funny to think about. You know, you're right that this is this is a film very much geared towards kids and mm -hmm. young adults and stuff like that and it's uh, and that's why it makes sense that that's going to get more of like mtv award mm -hmm. nominations oh, definitely. and teen choice awards i mean you think of like julia styles got uh nominated for breakthrough female heath ledger got nominated for best um male or best musical performance oh yes for his little sing song and dance number in the stadium you. yeah, yeah. that's great um again you know she was nominated for the teen choice award for breakthrough performance they got nominated for sexiest love scene um soundtrack of the year was a nomination uh it's just a very um it's a really fun movie it's a really fun there's movie. a lot of high school movies that are only fun when you're close to high school and then yeah, you look back in retrospect and you're like oh this is not one of those no this this really works yeah i still i still I, I also just like seeing little little baby face joseph gordon levitt running yeah. around he's so so uh, little <laughs> i mean it's funny to think about him because this is like post or towards the end of mm -hmm. third rock from the sun which so this, him and larissa olenek were also a couple in that right so. yeah but like he was very much like felt like uh, a, a like slimy little kid on that to me with his long <laughs> hair like very very much hippie. But this was finally like the first time I was like, okay, this kid is actually mm -hmm. doing something yes. beyond that. Yes, that's true. So, yeah, let's say that was very good. Yes. Dropping back into the realm of like mysticism and sorcery, and based on books, and based on books, we're going to talk Harry Potter. Got it. I mean, it's pretty much the reason that the young adult, the YA genre became such a genre was yeah. because of the success of Harry Potter. Because they, unlike many other popular books, were specifically written for young people rather than being written for adults and just about young people. Yeah. I mean, it's also, I think, very much... I mean, I guess maybe, like, the Beatles one would be different, but, like, in... 10 Things I Hate About You like, mm -hmm. is enjoyed by older people, but not near soy. Like, there's a fanatical audience of adults yes. that sort of found y the young adult mm -hmm. literature along with Harry Potter. Yes. Like, and that's since continued on with things like Twilight and that's whatnot. That's how I remember. I still remember at, at the time that the fourth book was coming out, I worked next door to a Barnes and Noble oh, and I God. worked graveyard. And I had never seen in my life people uh, a midnight opening at a Barnes and Noble and people lining up outside. And I was like, what are these people lining up for? And I was like, oh, it's a kid's book. That seems like a fervor for a kid's book. And then as I started researching, wow, adults are into this kid's oh, book yeah, as too? Much, like, wow, yeah. this is a crazy fervor they've got going. Yeah, no, it's, it's I mean, story of young Harry Potter. Boy wizard! The boy who lived. Yes, the muggle. Yeah, half muggle. <laughs> Huh. I'm no, just saying, okay. Muggle in the beginning. He's yeah. not a. He's a normal. He's a normie. Yes, he's as a normie. I like to call him. Was, yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's it's. He's, full, he's not actually he's a, a full muggle at all. Yeah, but full I just muggle. like calling him one yeah. because in the beginning he might as well be one. Yeah. But I mean, it's sort of a kid who discovers, you know, that he's a wizard. Mm -hmm. That he has this 
history of being his family being wizards. Yes. He makes some friends who are wizard as he goes to wizard school, yes. and he has to deal with Lord Valdemort, the, mm-hmm. the one who sh- is not named or whatever yeah, they he call. Who shall not be named? Yeah, which um, is just a great thing to do to a villain. Make him make him someone oh, that's an great. unnamed. <laughs> no, totally. I mean, speak his name and he gives him power. Oh, scary! Yeah, and it is kind of scary. <laughs> it, I mean, I think I think there's an element of truth to that. To be yeah. fair, like there's you a know, reason that in the Star Wars movies he's just the Emperor because that's much scarier than Emperor Palpatine. Yeah, yeah, it definitely. <laughs> has an air of like um, fear to him yes. but it's also like you know there's something beautiful in the story I guess sort of in the same line of like Star Wars where it's mm. about a kid who grows up to fight the person who killed his parents and yes. granted Star Wars it actually ends up being yes. you know, but one still. of them but, um, but still like it's an element of like you know being kind of brought cyclical. up into a destiny that yeah, exactly. fulfills itself in, a, in some yeah, way or at least totally. closes its own yeah. loop I think that's exactly. If we were to talk right. about another Joseph Gordon-Levitt wonder, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a looper. <laughs> um, but you know, it's 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 definitely a fun film. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the all of them have, were fun. I think yes. personally, Prisoner of Azkaban was my favorite. I you mm-hmm. know I like the end ones, definitely. but you know, it's yeah, it's still it's a very good yes. film. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, it's just to show a rise of how the from the time the first book came out till the movie fervor happened how much uh it changed for jk rowling so in the beginning you know it's known as the harry potter and the philosopher's stone everywhere yes. else except for yes. the usa and so much so that in every scene in which the philosopher's stone was mentioned was filmed twice once wow. with them saying philosophers and one with them saying sorcerers or redubbed and the, and that was to keep them consistent with the book series because the u.s publisher Scholastic changed the title to Sorcerer's Stone. Uh, The title change was done with consent of J.K. Rowling, but she has since said that she regrets having granted permission and as a fledgling author, because this would have been her first book, Mm -hmm. she wasn't in a strong enough position to fight it at the time. Flip from that to fast forward when the first movie comes out, the movie has the distinction of opening on more screens in the USA than any other in retrospect to uh, the unrated bully that we talked about earlier this week. 3,762 Which, screens. Which, at that time. Like, yes. since, well, yes. then, I, since then, I think we've crossed, like, 4,000 screens yeah, or I'm, something. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Bigger. But, like, that's that's crazy to go from, like, that kind of change from being, like, a nobody author to, like, the most at the time. Yeah. So. No, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, it, it was deservedly awarded. Yes. You know, it got three Academy Award nominations for uh, set decoration, mm-hmm. art design, costume design, original score, John Williams. He yeah. always gets nominated. You can't have John um, Williams not do it. You know, just tons and tons mm-hmm. of BAFTA awards, best feature film, best performance by a child and or best performance by actor in a supporting role. Yes. For Robbie Coltrane, you know, stuff like that. Like, it is just... Incredible how mm-hmm. many awards was Kid Choice Awards, favorite movie nominated. Yes. Um, it's just amazing. It is. Favorite Teen Choice Awards, favorite movie or drama action adventure movie. Jeez, so just loaded up. Yeah, it's just very, very loaded. Mm-hmm. So, very, very good movie. But, um, you know, Christopher Columbus definitely has experience with those sort of movies, doing things like Home Alone, the Goonies. Yeah, yeah. So, very much, um, well, he wrote that one. Well, but, yeah. he's involved. It's, that's what matters. Involved. He's involved, so, <laughs> you know, nevertheless. Um, moving right along, we're going to talk about The Chronicles of Narnia. Mm-hmm. Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, of yes. course. This is the first in the series, though I don't remember. Like this is It's one of, the second chronologically. Yeah, this is one of those series that's very, very sort of complex and convoluted in that virtually none of the characters carry over between all of the films. Yes. I think there's only a couple books where the same characters appear mm-hmm. in them. Yeah, um, and those and, are usually the ones with Prince Caspian in it. Yeah, and the the the, t- the chronology of it is all sorts of sort of wacky. Yeah, the like, magician's nephew, I think, is like the sixth book, but is the first one chronologically mm-hmm. takes place before the Lion, the Witch, and the yeah. Wardrobe. Um, anyway, this is about you know a family of kids during I believe it's the bombing. Yeah, it's in during England. the Blitz, the actual uh, New uh, England or. London Blitz when Germany was bombing uh, England. Who go to live with um, like some family. extended family? I forget exactly yeah. how. And they discover there's a magical um, wardrobe, wardrobe that teleports them into to another land, fantastical Narnia. world. Yes, that where James McAvoy plays a satyr. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, what's it called? It. Um, and Liam Neeson Liam voices Neeson's Aslan, a, yeah, a the lion. Christ allegory. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the things that is frequently mentioned about this book, um, or the series, is mm-hmm. the, the allegory to Christ. I mean, this well, is. Well, C.S. Lewis was very devout Christian, so it's not really surprised that he would have. Surprising but, that he'd have such a strong allegory. I and mean, again, in this, story. this is not something that's unique to this 
book. I mean, yeah. you think Twilight was it was it Mormon allegory? Was that? What uh, I think so. Yes, yeah. Stephanie Meyer. Yeah. Um, but there's religious overtones to mm-hmm. a lot of these movies and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So and it's also not surprising that the movie uh, that, that the Chronicles of Narnia bears some similarities to the Lord of the Rings because Tolkien and Lewis were contemporaries and in a writing group together called the Inklings. Okay, one correction: it's four kids, not three. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, but you know, I mean, this is one of those things that I remember reading as a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember seeing, I think it was on PBS, there's a a version of it, which is much, obviously, lower budget. Mm -hmm. So when this one came, it was sort of like, I don't know how this is going to go. And it was also, I believe, funded by Walden Media, which was um, a book chain or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was... Because they had the uh, adaption rights, because before C.S. Lewis died, he sold his adaption rights to the entire Narnia series. At the time, he absolutely despised television adaptations of books, of his books, believing they were non-realistic since actors had to wear suits to play non-human mm. characters. And it was only after seeing a demo reel of creatures created with computer graphics and the advancement of that technology that his stepson slash the co-producer, Douglas uh, Grisham, approved the film adaptions to happen because of his uh, stepdad's annoyance at the wow. TV ones and, and the idea of these totally unhuman characters being played by humans. So, I mean, it seemed appropriate, I mean, I, in retrospect, technology-wise, that this is sort of one of those things that, like, we finally have achieved a level of technology yes. where we can actually recreate these things without, mm-hmm. like, you know, being Wizard of Oz-like and have, like, oh, I'm a lion, I'm a lion, I'm, <laughs> I'm a donkey. Totally yeah. a lion. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, it felt appropriate that they could technology-wise, mm-hmm. but I was still a little skeptical going into it, yes. perhaps because I loved the stories as a kid. Yeah. Um, also, I think I... The, as a film lover, should have been a little bit more skeptical, maybe or maybe not, depending on your perspective, because it was directed by Andrew Adamson, mm. who did Shrek 1, Shrek yes. 2, stuff like that. So, yes. depending on how you stand on the Shreks, perhaps that's a good thing, perhaps yeah. that's a bad thing, but d- at least he's experienced with working with computer graphics and yeah. stuff, so that was definitely a benefit. You know, after well, I saw... Not, much uncan- uh, not as much un- Uncanny Valley as many other CG no. films, I would say. But, you know, it's, it's definitely... I was I was I enjoyed the first one. It's not it's not bad. No. It's, it's just, you know, the problem is it's it's kind of I, I like to equate the lack of success uh domestically, not internationally. Internationally this movie's clean house. But domestically yeah. of the of the Chronicles of Narnia series to John Carter. Where mm, where where by the time we could make a movie to have it look right, so many of those other elements had either been done before, done better or done so popularly that it wasn't as new and as exciting as it was when it was initially mm. created. John Carter, all this, all that stuff was you know used in Star Wars and so many things later, but by the time it was made, all those things had already come out. In the same way with Chronicles of Narnia. Lord of the Rings had already happened. I mean, you know, sure. we'd seen a lot of these things before, so it wasn't so new and wow to domestic markets. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like the visual angle, which is funny because it was nominated for Best Achievement in Visual Effects at the <laughs> Academy Awards, uh, Best Achievement in Makeup, and Best Achievement in Sound Mixing. Wow. But the thing, or it won Achievement in Makeup. Sorry. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, but the thing that I think, I mean, in terms of what was visually done, yeah, we'd done stuff more impressive, mm-hmm. I guess. But I always, it was the story that I found the most interesting. Oh, I agree. And, you know, you know, the story is very the, fascinating. The White Witch. Mm-hmm. Uh, Played by uh, Tilda Swinton. Is one of the sort of interesting characters because it's about, you know, not just being evil, but luring one of these kids. Mm-hmm. Under her sort of uh, sway. sway, and then try and manipulate that to find the rest of them, kill them all, and take over, defeat Aslan. Very evil. Yeah. So it's it's Gotta very like that. It's it's a very it's a very fun story. Like I mean, maybe there's more action in this than I remembered reading the books. Mm. I don't know. I well, have to go back and read the. Read it's the... just like with Lord of the Rings, you cut out a lot of the walking and you expand the action yeah. stories. So <laughs> it's, it's definitely good. But I mean, in terms of like, it got nominated for a whole bunch of awards. It got nominated for an Annie Award for uh, character animation. Hmm. It was nominated for some Golden Globes for best original song and an original score. Hmm. Um, original song should note is. Um, Alanis Morissette for wow. Wonderkind. I did not remember that being in the movie. Neither did I, and but, I'm a fan uh, of her. It was also um, nominated for Visual Effects Society Awards and stuff like that. So it was it was regarded in a, a lot of different angles. Mm-hmm. And uh, also want to note that 
Georgie Hensley was nominated for Best Breakthrough Performance. Interesting. Um, um, for those interested about she where... Was Lucy Oh, okay. Pensy. Thank you. Just FYI. Um, for those wondering where the series is going, because they made three films. Yes. And uh, as of now, no fourth film is on the horizon. And here's kind of some, some of the reasons why. In October 2011, Douglas Gresham, the stepson co-producer... Uh, of the films and stepson of C.S. Lewis uh, stated that Walden Media who you brought up before, mm. their contract with the C.S. Lewis estate had expired I think their financial <laughs> yeah. with state the, was not quite yeah. as good anyway. With Walden Media no longer having exclusive purchasing rights to any future Narnia films uh, thus any production of a future on f future film is kind of indefinitely mm. on hold um, it was originally assumed that 2014 would be the earliest a production of another of Narnia film could even begin, hmm. according to the mor moratorium placed on the C.S. Lewis estate and with the rights to sell the book options. Mm. Uh, however, in May of 2012, Grisham confirmed that technically any studio still has the option of making a Narnia film during the moratorium, but without the involvement of Walden Studios, it cannot be released until 2018 Whoa. at the earliest, which wow. is the actual end of the moratorium. Wow, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Grisham also hinted that Walden Media's lapse in renegotiating their contract with the state was due to internal conflicts uh, between both companies about the direction of the future films. Because uh, I, th I think they wanted... Yeah, uh, contrary to Walden Media's initial plan, Grisham stated they planned to make Silver Chair be the next film, hinting that future films might be made independently. Because the uh, next one, I think, in the book was The Magician's Nephew, which is the mm. before... And Silver Chair continues the story of Prince Caspian, so it makes sense that if you wanted to actually get the audience going, you would want to... I mean, I, th I think, you know, it's, it's one of those ones that there are a couple reasons I see that it had trouble going forward. I mean, yeah, it did fairly well worldwide. Yes. But, number one, it wasn't quite a hit on the scale of something like Harry Potter. No. And to spend a lot of money, it's sort of like yes. not quite... To be not quite as profitable, like it was a little bit of like... It becomes harder and harder to sell. Justify, yeah. yeah. And number two, because there's no continuity during the characters, yes. like that makes it really hard for audiences to get attached to somebody. Like, yeah. you know, we get attached to Harry Potter. They exactly. They get attached to uh, Robert Pence and yeah. Twilight. That's why like the that. second two films w were much better together than because they both have Prince Caspian in it. So, mm -hmm. And then Silver Chair would have continued to have Prince Caspian, so you're at least having consistent characters at that point. But... It's, it's just, it's not enough. Like, they needed more consistency in the series, if you ask I, I me. I think that was a problem for me as a kid trying to read them, was the yeah. consistency of the series. I remember getting to the silver chair and being very confused as to what was going on with yeah. the story. And as a kid, it's weird to just sort of jump around like that. Yeah, sure. and, and to have them be numbered one through seven, but not chronologically, yeah. is, is very hard for yeah. a child, I think, to get their grasp yeah. on. Yeah. All right, let's move along to probably, again, one of the more applicable ones to Beautiful Creatures, and that is Twilight. What you might as well call the penultimate supernatural teen romance yeah. story. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely think of them in the same sort of context as sort of like, you know, uh, a couple people from different sides of the tracks mm -hmm. uh, get connected together. It turns out there's a whole... Um, Supernatural element in the world. story yeah. to one of them that yes. the other ones introduced yep. to. Um, you know, their their love puts them in danger. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's very interesting. Like, you know, have you seen any of the Twilight movies? I have unfortunately seen the entire first Me, Twilight movie. I've I've seen I've seen I've actually seen all of them. If that is really much more unfortunate. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that like the story is very sort of heavy handed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think. Kirsten Stewart as Bella mm -hmm. is um, kind of exhausting. Like, she plays <laughs> Morose so much that it's kind of tiring. But, you know, there's some elements that, like, uh, I kind of get why it could have been a big series. You know, like, there, there is Part no... Part of it being that her character is so bland that anybody yeah. could fit themselves into that role well, and not have a hard character break because she doesn't have any. Like, I think there's something interesting about sort of that rivalry between vampires and werewolves. As like, we've I, spoken before in a previous episode yeah, about I mean, vampires and werewolves. I, th I think that's sort of an interesting thing. I mean, I think, you know, it's so underlined by the elements of uh, the romance mm -hmm. between her and Edward that it kind of makes everything else a little bit blasé. I mean, there's, there's interesting plot lines throughout the series, like, um, 
there's an army of young vampires, mm-hmm. which are apparently the strongest ones yes. according to the series, which I thought was sort of interesting. Mm-hmm. There's uh, the Volturi, which I yes, don't know if you're, which are sort of like the leaders of the vampires mm-hmm. who sort of come back in the final films and sort of like become troublemakers mm-hmm. towards them. I think there's a lot of interesting sort of individual points, but it doesn't feel as cohesive to me. Yeah. And it feels like a lot of the like the more interesting characters ends up end up dying or mm. leaving the series as it goes on and it sticks around with like the love triangle between Kirsten Stewart J- uh, Taylor Lautner and, and Robert Pattinson yeah, yeah which is probably the least interesting storyline to me yeah but then again I'm not a young teen or an older you know and it, adult. I, there's just I don't know I being maybe it's because I'm a married white straight male that I don't fully connect and I'm older that I don't connect to this but there's sure. very much a, a like a like fob old style like romance novel fabio cover oh, yeah. style sure. element to these like romance stories in present day where it's just like kind of Romeo and Juliet esque like you're not allowed and it's like everyone tells you you can't but it's true love and you have to go together and that and I mean that even carries over so far even in the fact that a very popular series of books right now that's trying to be made in films 50 shades of gray started out as fan fiction of twilight yeah i mean i think and then it didn't do any itself any service by like being i think it was a, a mormon allegory or whatever yeah, because it was. yeah Stephanie that definitely very mormon that turned people off uh i think that them messing around with sort of like the classic vampire tropes like yes. you know not they being able to go in the sun yeah, they like, just glitter like, instead like i think that aggravated some people i think the popularity of the series as is common with popular Twilight things moms. turned people off as well <laughs> yeah. i mean i i i don't necessarily hate the series i just i wish i do i i just i don't feel like it really did as much with what it could have no that's the, that's my biggest problem is that basically they took well-established things that already existed in and made them less interesting to me like if vampires don't have any restrictions why wouldn't they control the entire world? I don't yeah. care how many werewolves there are out there. If they don't have any restrict, that's the one. That's the reason that was made in the original vampiric stories. To <laughs> they're out of all the different types of monsters, they're one of the most overpowering and aware of themselves. Yeah. And so you have to give them a drawback so that mankind doesn't just immediately become cattle, which yeah. is something that often comes up in vampire movies. Which, is vampires trying to take over? I think that's like very much a plot line for like True Blood. Oh yeah, definitely. So, you know, yes. uh, it, it's it's just. But as you said, like this is we are not the group that this it's is speaking true. to. Which I mean, you think about it, like look at the MTV Awards. It, cool. it won. It won best movie, best female performance, breakthrough male performance for Robert Pattinson, uh, best fight for the end one, best kiss for Robert Pattinson and Kirsten Stewart, nominated for breakthrough male for Taylor Lautner, um, Teen Choice Awards. It won best drama, best actor Robert Pattinson, best actress. Kirsten Stewart, Best Villain, Cam Gaganji, Best Fresh Face Female, Ashley Green, Best no. Fresh Face Male, Taylor Lautner, <laughs> Choice no. Lip Lock, Choice <laughs> Movie Rumble, Choice Movie Album. Like, the, the no. clearly yeah. the young audience is obsessed with this movie because. <clears throat> Speaking of movie album, this is just the kind of thing that I'm sure, I'm sure this can be done cool, but I find this is a very weird element of of this series stephanie meyer has actually cited uh both muse the band and lincoln park the band as inspirations for her to Hmm. write the books which i could exhaust you all with how stupid that is but and the fact that they both are in the soundtrack no shit um it's but it's just like really like really like really yeah Really? Like weird rap rock and like your like British rock inspired you to as a Mormon to write vampire werewolf love fiction. Uh, what? It's just, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Like, I know. Like, I know. It's it's one of those things that like so many people are so angry about it, and it's just like it's not worth the energy to freak hey, out. You about know, the it. reason I saw Twilight in the first place because I saw it on Rift Tracks, and that's and that was great. Because man. Ooh, they lambast that movie to back. As to bad as back. bad as Twilight is, I don't feel like it gets to that point where it's bad enough that it's entertaining again. Like oh it's, no, it's just, no, it's sort of like 
It's very much like Identity Thief, which I just saw oh. last week, which was it wasn't it just wasn't funny. I was just indifferent to it, and that's sort of how I feel through Twilight. I'm yeah. just I'm just not. And indifference particular. is almost worse because when you have people yeah. that are vitriolic about something, then the fans have something to argue against. But if you have if someone's like, "Do you see Twilight? It was amazing." You're like, "Yeah, it was meh." Then yeah. how, what do they have to argue against it? Like, didn't this excite you? No. Did you hate this? Not really. Yeah. Meh. I also think it's just a weird element of the sh of it, considering that the books were inspired by these bands that were also mm. in the soundtrack that Robert Pattinson unknowingly contributed two songs to the first film. Wow. Uh, apparently, he didn't know that a mysterious third party, um, I forget what her name is, it was one of the actresses in the film. Um, mm. uh, da -da 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 -da. Oh, it doesn't matter right now. Um, uh, one of the actresses gave... Uh, yeah, he'd given the director a copy of music he had recorded years ago, huh. and they decided to use two of the songs, and he was surprised to hear them when viewing early film footage. Wow. Uh, the songs are Never Think, played during the restaurant scene, and Let Me Sign, played during the scene where Edward has to drink Bella's blood to save her. Wow. Pattinson said he was overwhelmed by how well Let Me Sign fit into the film. <laughs> and I guess, like, there's him playing the piano in the film, that's him. They got, wow. like, he was actually, cool. a, yeah, actually a really t a talented musician yeah. of some sort. But all of this brings us to this Friday, February 15th. Mm -hmm. we're Day talking after Valentine's Day, so what mm. a surprise that Supernatural Romance film mm. would come out. We're talking beautiful creatures. Yes. This is the story of a, a young man who meets a girl in his school mm -hmm. who comes from a... Uh, I think he almost hits her with a car. Very no. similar to Twilight. Uh, yeah, there's a moment where he does almost hit her with a car, but he has met her before that, I okay. think. Um, but, like... She has her, her family has sort of a sketchy history mm -hmm. in the town. Mysterious, even one though, might say. Even though they founded the town. <laughs> um, and he certainly, he learns that she's a caster. Mm -hmm. Don't say which. Which is apparently like calling someone geek or a nerd. I see. Um, according to the movie. Okay. And probably the book that yeah. it came from. You know, the thing that I was most surprised with is initially, I from the movie trailers, I had thought that the movie was from her perspective. Mm, but it's from his? It starts out, at least, from his perspective with him as the narrator. Because well, isn't isn't the point not just that it, she's a, a caster, but that at some age they have to choose if they're going to be yeah. light or dark. And so he's She doesn't trying, have to you don't choose. You, you become one yeah. or the other. Like, right? it's de like whatever your nature is okay. determines it. And he's you. trying to help push her towards light. Not nah, really. I mean, he like she she does have like a countdown. I forget if it's like it's like a hundred days or something hmm. when the film starts. Um, and yeah, there's an event that will push you one way or the other, or not not an event, but your nature will push okay. you one way or the other. And he sort of just he loves her, of course. I mean, they're from different sides of the tracks and love each other. Um, but he's Juliet, she's Romeo. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But you know, there's a, there's no like love triangle like Twilight, but mm. there is more of family pressure on her with the relationship because it's perceived that their relationship is gonna could negatively impact her and push her to dark because of the emotions that are drawn mm -hmm. up and stuff like that teenagers and puberty yeah <laughs> and i mean there's definitely like competition for her between the light side and the dark side trying to get her um to sway mm -hmm. one way or the other, mm -hmm. and because clearly she comes from an important family, if they founded the town. I mean, it's very interesting because it's. It, I, it, I was surprised to hear it was from his perspective, hmm. and that at least in the beginning he's the narrator and stuff like that. At a certain point, it feels like it kind of switches and is more focused on her. Interesting. But the thing that I was most surprised is going into it, I thought that. Uh, like Viola Davis is in it, Emma mm -hmm. Thompson, Jeremy Irons. I thought they were going to be the best part of the movie. Mm. And actually, the kids, uh, Lena, played by Alice Englart, and Ethan, played by Alden Einrich, okay. um, were actually pretty good. Huh. They're pretty good. They're huh. they're fairly um, charming, in particular Ethan. And arguably the best parts of the movie are when they're on it together, hmm. like interacting together, which is sort of... Um, the opposite, so, the, of like the opposite of Twilight. Twilight. Yeah. That's exactly what um, I was going to say. So that was... Have bland and blander. That was a really big <laughs> surprise for me. I was not expecting that when I saw the movie. Granted, the movie's not great. Uh, I was hoping for more action. I thought it was going to be like an actioned up version of Twilight. Mm. But it's actually... Might have less action than Twilight. Oh, God. Um, so that's oh, unfortunate. God. But it's... It's not awful. It's just not great either. I mean, it's clearly set up to be a franchise. Yeah. Clearly set up to be a franchise, and I guess depending on the success of it, it's very much set up to be the follow-up to the end of Twilight. So yeah, 
we'll see if it really capitalizes yeah, on it. I'm not entirely convinced that it will do that, but it's very much set up on that. I don't know how many books, if the, all the books are out yet, or if they're still being written. I think there I, are at least three that I'm aware yeah, of. Yeah, I do know that like in 2010, MTV put the book series down as like the, the series to watch. Which, if yeah. you think about, means they didn't take waste any time getting this movie made. Cause well, that, I mean, if MTV's back in this, it might be a bigger franchise than I've ever realized. Like, I really haven't heard a heck of a lot of buzz going into it, except that it looked like you yeah. know another Twilight type yeah. of movie. So, I mean, it definitely maybe. didn't have the fervor of another young adult franchise that we purposely left out, being Hunger Games. Yeah, uh, and that. It, so, I mean. Who knows? Maybe, yeah, maybe I, because I it doesn't even, have so much fervor, it'll be a little bit more popular. I maybe. never heard of this franchise Neither before I. the movie, so. But we'll again, see. I don't read that many young adult movie yeah. books anymore. But like, I'd heard of Twilight before Twilight, and I'd heard of Hunger Games before Hunger yeah. Games. I'd heard of any of the like any yeah, number Harry of Potter before Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah, so it's sort of like to not hear about it. I think does speak to how much consciousness there is about it. I think it. it speaks two ways. It speaks, you know, in one element, it could actually be really popular because of that, because there's not so much fervor already that many more new people would jump into it. It could. And on the other hand, it clearly shows that the genre and the style is what they're looking for to make money off of more than they are looking on something that's really, really popular. And you got to say, you know, for a franchise to generate at least three books, like, that says yeah. that it's making money. Yeah. I mean, they're not going to publish books that aren't selling, so clearly they're yeah. doing something right. Yeah, exactly. Um, with that being said, uh, join us next time for our DVD rundown for the week of February 19th. Mm -hmm. We're almost done with February mm -hmm. already. And as always, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes, we're on Blip.tv, we're on Miro, we're on Roku. You're going to get glue for some badges, leave us some reviews views on iTunes, comment on stuff places so that we can comment back and yeah. call you bad words and then you can Email call us, us more bad tweet words. Tweet us, and, all that yeah. good stuff. Yeah. And, uh, we'll catch you later. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.